R E A R E A R E A R E A Audio. r e a audio 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 Oh, thank you so much. I, I'm proud that you listened to us. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you. Um, so we we went through a little bit in depth last time you were on. Again, it was it seems like forever ago. I think it was only about six months ago. But do you mind giving folks just a refresher as to uh, you know how you got to where you are and what you do today? Sure. So I am a board certified uh, lawyer in Florida. I'm board certified in the area of workers' compensation. I work at Ericlides Gilman, where I'm a partner. I manage our Tampa office. I've been with the firm this, since this past November, 15 years. Well, you don't look like you could be a lawyer for 15 years. Listen, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Boy, 15 years. Thank Congratulations. You. That's great. Thank That's great. you. It's been it's, it's a great ride. I mean, I've been practicing 18 years. So, I mean. It's amazing. Time has been good. It does. It goes fast. You know, one of the reasons why we enjoy having you on is because of your really intense focus on the injured worker. And that's kind of been one of the um, it's kind of been one of the focuses that we've taken on here, both at Reemployability and RA Audio, is to kind of pivot a little bit and try to uh, really give the human side of what it is that we do on a daily basis because it is so very easy to get jaded in in what it is that we do mm -hmm. and and so that's why we we love having you on and you have a great perspective uh, a great legal perspective for both the employer and the injured worker and it was great having you on last time so you know as as we launch into 2022 uh, we're i can't believe already like five six weeks into it so Yashika, help us to understand a little bit in your mind, what's the most important legal issue or issues facing workers' comp as we move into the new year? Well, right now, workers' comp, I'm seeing still COVID cases and also the issue of the arising out of. So in workers' compensation, the accident has to arise out of and during the course and scope of your employment. The arising out of really became a bigger issue in the last couple of years, the Valport uh, case. And this was an injured worker who suffered, who worked from home, who had an accident when she tripped over her dog while getting coffee on a break. Now, if that had happened in the office, then her tripping over something in the office would have made her claim compensable. She tripped at home on her dog. And that dog was not related at all to her employment, right? Her having the dog or tripping over the dog was not connected at all to the employment. And so what we're finding now is I'm seeing more and more cases where um, employee carriers are raising that defense that you may have been at work, but if you can't connect the cause of your accident to your employment, we're going to deny your claim. So I think we're going to see a lot more of those type denials coming up. And then you have the COVID cases. So actually, can I step back before we go sure. into the COVID cases? So why do you feel like that's more of an issue now than it was, you know, last time, we, like a year ago? Why, do, why is that something we should be on the lookout for this year? I think, well, because we're seeing more cases where that defense has been raised and it's been raised successfully. And so when you see a defense that's been raised successfully, so you have a case, it goes to the first DCA, the first DCA makes an, a ruling. And then it gives us some guidance as to how we practice, how our defenses work, what types of evidence we need, right? Mm -hmm. And so when you see lower court decisions applying that first DCA case that's only a few years old, that's telling you, okay, we feel comfortable based on this decision and the facts that we have, that we are going to continue to deny cases using the same, um, the same defense. And they're successful in those denials. And so I can foresee employer carriers taking a more stringent look at those um, work accidents where there's no cause, right? Mm -hmm. I trip, but I don't know why. Um, I lost my balance, but I don't know why. Well, in that particular case, you still have to connect that accident to the employment. And so I think that's going to kind of be on the rise. There was a case that came out not too long ago. So I can see that. 
I don't know why I always kind of thought that would always be the case. Like, like employers would always be trying to truly prove that it happened at work. I get, you know, like if you're, if you're moving pipes around and you drop a pipe on your foot, right? That's pretty obvious. Right. But this sounds like it's more nuanced type of injuries. Do you think it has anything to do more with more people working at home? You know, maybe, but at mm -hmm. the time of this particular case, we weren't dealing with COVID. Right. So I can definitely, definitely see it being applied because a lot of our um, employers are doing remote work. They are definitely allowing people to have more of a, um, a hybrid type working environment. And so you're going to see more accidents happening at home if people are working from home. Is there anything that you can see an employer should be aware of to try to prevent this type of thing happening down the road? Well, I would say if you are allowing your employee to work from home, I would have some really um, well thought out rules mm -hmm. as to workspace, pets, um, household chores, you know, those types of parameters to ensure as best you can that the workspace is isolated simply for work and that they're not working in their kitchen, right? right. Um, which in some instances, that's your situation because you don't have an office or you don't have an extra bedroom that you can turn into an office. You're working from home and you're making the best of it based on mm -hmm. what you have. Mm -hmm. um, that really is some people's reality. And, and you can't, what can you say to that if the employer is not allowing you to come back to work? Right. And they're keeping you at home. You have no choice. And so you have to, I think, be really clear about work supplies and the, what type of chair you're using, what type of desk are you using, whether it's ergonomic. All of those things kind of play into potential injuries that may arise that you don't think of at work because your workspace typically at the office is pretty ergonomic, right? Mm -hmm. You have a good chair. If you don't, you can request another chair or you can request a standing desk or um, have your screen elevated. So there are things that you do naturally at work that you really would not be able to do at home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm sure this opens up a whole lot of gray area, right? I mean, I can see myself like if I'm boiling ramen noodles for lunch, but I'm mm -hmm. working from home and I, I mean, and I burn myself, is that work related or not? I mean, right. I've been eating ramen noodles regardless. So uh, I guess maybe it's ramen noodles, but whichever, you, you know, it, I can see You're how good. there's a lot more kind of, kind of, kind of gray happening there. So, Absolutely. so that's good to know. Absolutely. So you had mentioned COVID. So obviously that is still the number one topic when we're talking to uh, employers and when we're talking to nonprofits, that's first thing that comes up. So what do you foresee in the COVID world? In the COVID world, I still foresee people being exposed to COVID, right? You have some employers who have a vaccine mandate and some employers who do not. And so with, with or without a vaccine mandate, some people are still being exposed and some people are still being sick. And so the question arises is, does your COVID exposure, did it happen at work or did it happen at home or when you were at church or when you were at the Publix or when you went to the restaurant? In workers' compensation, our exposure um, standard is very, very high. It's very high. It requires that the person has proof that they were exposed to a substance, that that substance was at work um, the amount of substance that they were exposed to and that the amount of exposure would result in the injury that that person sustained. That's a high burden. Mm -hmm. yeah. And especially with COVID because it's so communicable. So how do you know that you were exposed at work and that that exposure caused your illness? There's really mm -hmm. no way to tie that together, in my opinion, unless you have a person who is your first responder, someone who works on the COVID um, wing at a hospital or a nursing home, or you know, is directly comes into contact with um, patients who have COVID. Mm -hmm. Have you seen an increase or a decrease in those types of claims that you've been working with over the past year? I have not seen an increase in claims that are referred to me. So a lot of my clients are hospitals or nursing homes. And so those employers, um, they're under the presumption because if they have those employees who are working with COVID patients, then they're presumed to have contracted COVID um, at the employer. And so in those instances, those cases are handled, they're medical cases, um, and they never come to me. The cases that I'm seeing are those where someone has contracted COVID and there's been a denial of the compensability because there's no proof or there's no indication of where this person contracted the disease. Mm -hmm. 
Now, obviously, we're talking in Florida, and, and you mm -hmm. work in Florida, and so every state's a little bit different. Are right. you aware, not necessarily of the details in states, but I'm sure you all talk, right? <laughs> are there other states that you're aware of where anybody that might be listening in that state should probably look for more information because that proof of burden isn't quite where it is in Florida? For sure, California. I've heard that California's burden is a lot lower um, and that most people who are claiming exposure at work are being, their cases are being found to be compensable. So if you're in California, I would say Texas, those two states, and I would probably say even Georgia, you want to look at um, how those specific states are handling it. For instance, in Florida, we have a presumption that the governor entered um, right when COVID first hit. And that presumption is for your first responders and your medical professionals. Um, some other states may have done that as well. So I would start there with any particular presumptions that have been um, granted or provided by the governors in those states and then kind of work your way down to your exposure uh, standards. As things are getting more and more opened up around the country, again, we're in Florida, so it's a little bit different. But um, are you are you still advising that employers adhere to CDC guidelines for safety and things like that in the workplace, or are there other places that you're directing them? I try to stay away from that, unless it's a client that tells me they have had some exposures and we have a, an open claim. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, I encourage them to reach out to their HR or to their employment law attorney, because I don't want to get too muddled into those employment issues yeah. um, that are not directly connected to a work comp case. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm, I, I know you're an attorney, so I don't know how you're going to answer this question or not, but but because uh -oh. things have become, no, I, and, and I, I'm just curious, the, the way things have become so politicized with regards to COVID, right? How is it difficult for someone in your position to take that stance like you just did with regards to CDC guidelines, right? You said, I try to stay away from that. What does somebody like when somebody comes to you for advice like that? How how do you you must have a litmus test in your head that says, you know, I don't want to go there. I can go there. How does that work? So if it's a situation where a person or an employer wants to know about um, their, the impact of requiring the vaccine on their with for their employees, I'll go there. Mm -hmm. um, I will say, listen, there's case law that says if the person is vaccinated and they have um, a reaction to the vaccine, you are responsible to their for their reaction. That becomes a compensable condition, um, just a reaction. Um, because you've required the vaccine. And there's case law out there. The case law that we've seen has been on H1N1 or the flu vaccine. Um, and then I suggest, well, maybe consider if the person's getting vaccinated that you give them the day after off, you know, pay. That way they're able to rest and recuperate at home. So that's typically the type of advice that I would give. Um, so, but if a person says, hey, I have had an exposure at the office, what should I do? Then I immediately direct them to the CDC guidelines, like mm -hmm. follow the guidelines to a T, because that's the only thing that really and truly ensures that you're protecting your other employees. Mm -hmm. No, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, I, I hope I didn't mean to, I didn't mean to ambush you there. No, that that was question. A good question. I just <laughs> thought it was, you know, I've, I've always wanted to know that because you all are so good at um, it really delineating what's important and, and what's I don't want to say fluff, but just not, not what is supposed to be talked about. So that's great. Yashika, we're running out of time. So if you don't mind, can we continue this discussion next week? Absolutely. I'll see you next week. Awesome. Thanks. Thanks for listening this week to REA Audio. If you have any comments or suggestions for an upcoming episode, please let us know. You can email Todd at reemployability.com. Also, please follow REA Audio on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or Stitcher or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also check out more content at listen to rea.com. Next week, we'll continue our discussion with Yashika, learning more about what she sees as important issues in the year to come. Thanks for being with us and have an awesome and impactful rest of your day.